in. Happy Friday. Welcome to the Steve Dace Show here live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast. Mi amo is Stephen Dace, or Steve. As my friends call me, I just don't have a lot of those. But I do have a couple of them with me here today. Todd Erzin is here alongside Aaron McIntyre, joined by our good friend and New York talk show host, Shannon Joy, as well. Uh, she'll be joining us here momentarily for the Dace Group. You know the drill on a Friday. Next hour, we'll get to your feedback. We'll be responding to your responses to us coming up in the final hour on a Friday, the final hour of each and every week. But before we get to all of that, let us begin with the Dace Group. Your weekly look at the week that was begins, as it always does, with issue one. Bleep Lord Nefarious says. Drag is holy. There has been an assault on the rights of drag performers in this country, and we must call out the hypocrisy and the injustice. Jesus called himself a mother hen longing to gather up her chicks. Gender is a construct, you see. And if Jesus can be a mother hen, then you can dress in drag. I've even heard it said that Jesus was, and humanity is, God in drag. So let me say this again for those of you in the back. Drag is Holy. Hi, I was once a trans youth, and now I'm a happy 22-year-old trans adult student at New College of Florida. This is my health care. Ma'am? Okay. Don't tread on it. Senator Yarbrough has militarized the Florida GOP into the genital Gestapo. Ron DeSantis wants trans people dead. You are committing genocide. I grew up in Eloise. I am six. I'm a city child. I live at the Plaza Hotel, which is huge and wonderful and trace elegant, especially at Christmas time. So the last stage, white folks asking people of color, teach me about racism. I know I've got a problem. I need you to teach me about it. Now we've got white people looking for other white people who want to work on racism. We need to be one another's anti-racist white people. It's stage five. Or if you want to use, let's use Christian language, okay? It's like you've been discipled. And now you're going to go out and you're going to... It's like Jesus sent the disciples out two by two, okay? Now you're going out, and you're going out with other people that you're both disciples. You go out and you're going to go do the work. COVID vaccine can serve as an image of God's redemption. Redemption is God's ultimate answer to the problem of original sin. We need examples that can serve as metaphors of what Jesus accomplished that show us Jesus' redemption, well, it's kind of like that. I propose that the COVID vaccine is an image of redemption. Yes, the vaccine may have a distant origin story in abortion, but that past has been reworked and redeemed into something that saves life. Your 16-year-old's had COVID. Your 16-year-old gets better and now has recovered from COVID. You vaccinate them and they get myocarditis. Are you gonna give them two more vaccines? Your child, give them two more vaccines? I'm not a clinician, I would have to discuss. You have children. I do. Have you vaccinated your children? I have. How many times? Three or four times. Three or four times. 
There it is. Let us get to it, Shannon, because of both chivalry, ladies first, and you are the guest. You get to go first. What was the most disgusting, revolting thing that you just saw? Well, it was all disgusting and revolting, and I think it's more the theme of the just absolutely wicked, profoundly wicked and deceptive left now just fully embracing the dogmatic themes and the godlike themes and the faith, the di- disciples, the apostles, right? Like trying to wrap everything into what seems to be a faith, you know, and it is evident that this is emerging, that it is, you know, when you remove truth, you remove virtue and principles and God from virtually everything because we're humans and we are born to worship, we're going to have to embrace something else. And we're really dealing with um, completely unhinged, wicked and demonic forces. I mean, that's really what I come away with, even dealing with it here in my own community, we are embarking one of my local um, education groups on removing dozens of, of absolutely horrific pornographic materials from our school libraries, you know, within a mile of my home. And you would not believe how viciously they are clinging to these pornographic materials, the the abuse of children. These are neighbors, friends, individuals I've known uh, for much of my life who in a small number of them, but we shake our heads and realizing that we're dealing with something much, much bigger mm-hmm. than politics, much, much bigger than uh, a curriculum. This is, it. you know, I mentioned to my mother just the other day, it feels like we're going into high places. Like we are Mm -hmm. going into a battlefield, a spiritual battlefield that is insanely dark. And that's what I see. Because you are Mm. that that's, that's exactly what you are doing. What is taking place in this country isn't a political argument. It isn't about ideology or even morality or even philosophy. This is just straight up now open spiritual warfare that has spilled out from the unseen realm into the streets. And that's what you're, when you see stories like I just got in here a little while ago, uh, 13 men, old length, a 13 year old drag queen. I don't, no one answer anything out loud. Just think quietly to yourself. How would every previous generation of Americans, regardless of socioeconomic status, have responded to something like this. Exactly. Todd, what did uh, what were you the most disgusted by? Well, I almost forgot to even think of one because halfway through that, and Steve, you set the precedent, so I thought it was viable. I almost walked off the set, quite frankly, because what I don't, I can't, I can't do all the things that need to be done because we have this ridiculous system that now sees one of the greatest sins in culture is for men to be men and do what must be done mm-hmm. um because i'll just say like um hurting people is high on my list mm. for all of that and it would i'd feel i prayed about it and i feel real good about it steve um but it's, it's on the top of that list though i mean there's so many deviants after a fair trial, uh, of course. Yeah, there's so many details. After after a fair trial, sure, of course. Yes, sure. Of course. But um, the 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 total uh, loser, who's part of Team uh, David French and Russell Moore, there, who's I don't know, like youth pastor, whatever. What's it, who is that guy? What His is, name is irrelevant because he is legion. Um, I, I it, it wouldn't matter. It wouldn't it wouldn't matter if the dude stepped in front of a van on the street five seconds after he said that. I promise you there'd be legions more just willing to step right into that breach and take his place. I mean, he's and even waiting. more unwilling to confront him on any yeah. level occupying mm-hmm. your pulpits and, as well. Yeah. Yes. I mean, the very first guy, the 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 the, the pastor, I don't know if the, that looked like it might have been just guy posing as a pastor. But, you, you know, he it's he's he's possible because of the likes of that guy talking about vaccines as miracles and redeemers of abortions. I it, 
our ch our churches are filled with such abject cowardice and stupidity Amen. that it doesn't matter what we say about a damn thing after that. Yeah. That makes me sick. And that is the number one singular reason everything else in the culture is occurring. The frustrations mm. you have with a lack of political representation, no matter who wins, whether your votes will even get counted, even if uh, you do vote, uh, everything. The, the, yeah. the women who email me, I can't find a guy. What do I do? <laughs> How do I get my husband to actually lead our home? The men who email me and said, I've literally just, I, I didn't think I was going to become a priest and I, I'm, I'm forcefully celibate and not a priest. So the worst of both worlds, simply because I cannot find a woman uh, who is not completely worked over by third wave feminism on and on and on and on it goes the level the level the generations of father the, the fatherlessness the the uh, everything all stems and is all rooted from the last line of what you just said because the church is the plumb line for righteousness right. in any culture it is planted in it is the plumb line how will they hear the word if there is no one to teach it to them the commandment is not to make converts it is to make disciples teaching people a new discipline a new mm. discipline, meaning a new worldview, what it means to think and to live differently than what you were doing before. We've given up. We've given up on all of that collectively as a church. We're not doing that anymore. And, and that's why everything else that you guys just watched and watch every Friday at this time or we talk about every week, everything stems from there. That is the genesis, pardon the pun, that is the genesis story of everything occurring in the West. Aaron. There is a great line, how many times have I brought this up in the movie Nefarious that you will watch here in less than a month? There's a great line that sums up everything that Todd just said. It's a line that I think is the money shot line of dialogue in that movie. On the level of, you're just gonna stand, you're gonna do something or just stand there and bleed. And again, I'm not <laughs> going to give it away. I think, though, the more times the more times I tease this, you'll know exactly what it is. Do you know what it is that I'm talking about, Steve? I'll tell you in the break, maybe. Okay. Okay. But it's it describes because there's like perfectly. five money shots in that movie. That's true, but yeah. this one, in my opinion, is the best one. I think the worst of the worst. In case we needed any more red flags, which we didn't, but the dude named Dylan Mulvaney, mm. pretend, pretending to be a six-year-old girl. Yeah, what do you think's on his hard drive? Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. So that's the worst of the worst. Because that dude was like in the White House and given some uh, award uh, recently, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, that dude has issues, obviously. And is maybe, maybe channeling what he just channeled in that video, maybe has some legal issues as well forthcoming. Exit question. On a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being the odds Lindsey Graham would ever see a war he doesn't want your kid to die in, and 10 being the odds Lindsey Graham absolutely crushed his karaoke performance of In the Navy at the Blazing Saddle last weekend. Rate this week's level of total depravity, Todd. 10. Shannon. I'm at a 15 based on what I've seen in my own community over the past week. It's insane. Wow. Is that the insane. first time that Shannon said things are actually even worse? Normally she says that's uh, like, it's only like a five guys. You wouldn't believe it. No, yeah. It's insane. Yeah. I'm at like insane. an 11 or 12 this week. Yeah. Before we get to issue two, let's talk about our friends. Cause after that conversation, you might be thinking, let me get ready for when the sulfur hits. Call our friends over at My Patriot Supply. Get their three-month emergency food kit right now, and you'll save $200 per kit when you do. Save $200 per kit when you do. That's breakfast, lunch, dinner, even drinks and snacks, the full gamut, the full 2,000-plus calories that you need each and every day. This emergency food, by the way, stays good for well over 20 years with proper storage. It'll be delivered to you discreetly. Although you may want the neighbors to know uh, that, that you have it uh, because maybe you want them to get it as well. Uh, oh, we'll throw in free shipping as well. Free shipping on top of the savings of $200 off per kit when you go to MyPatriotSupply.com. $200 per kit off and free shipping at MyPatriotSupply.com. Let us get to issue two. DeSantis does his most in-depth interview yet. 
Ron DeSantis did his first major non-conservative media interview with Piers Morgan for Fox Nation, and it aired last night. Here are a few highlights. On COVID, DeSantis said... The approach to COVID w was different. I mean, you know, I would have fired somebody like Fauci. Uh, I think that he got way too big for his britches, and I think he did a lot of damage. Uh, I also think just in terms of my approach to leadership, you know, I get personnel in the government who have the agenda of the people and share our agenda. If you bring your own agenda in, you're gone. We're just not gonna have that. People are getting a bit worried about you. I think it's right. I think, I think they see me over the target. I'm obviously coming at it from a different perspective than they like to see. Those are all people on the, on the left and sometimes far left. Um, but here's the thing. I think the reason why I won the biggest landslide in the history of Florida for, for governor's race is because that criticism is so far removed from the reality. There's legitimate things we can criticize everybody for, including me. But when you start talking about being an autocrat, all I do is I look at my constitutional powers and I govern in a way to advance the uh, principles that I believe in. I'm passing things through the legislature. That's the constitutional way to do business here. There are prophetic words of warning from Dr. Waldman to Dr. Frankenstein. You have created a monster and it will destroy you. And you're alluding to what? <laughs> I, think I have seen the movie, though. It is a good movie. You know so. what I'm talking about, Governor. It's like where Dr. Frankenstein creates a monster and then loses control of the monster. And in the book, obviously, the monster ends up killing him. Well, look, at the end of you the... You know the parallel I'm making. At the end of the day, um, you know, what's best for the country? And let's put the country first rather than worry about any personalities or any type of, of individual um, ambition. But you know... At the end of the day, I'm a vessel for the aspirations of the people I represent. It's really not about me. So this interview is uh, just about an hour. You can watch the entire thing for free on YouTube. Um, and I watched the whole thing this morning before we came in. It's a pretty wide ranging interview. Gets into a lot of personal stuff. Uh, how he met his wife, her battle with cancer last year, um, uh, his own um, religious views, uh, the role of prayer in his life. Um, gets in, discusses a lot of very specific issues, uh, the death of his uh, sister several years ago and the impact that that had on him and his family. It gets pretty personal at times as well. Probably a lot of people are going to learn a lot more. I mean, I did. I, again, I don't know the guy. I met him in a hallway 10 years ago, okay, at, you know, in Washington, D.C. for like, you know, maybe 10 minutes. So I never have spoken to him since that moment. I don't know him whatsoever. Uh, so, I mean, I learned quite a few things that I did not know. I did not know that he was stationed at Gitmo uh, during the Iraq war. I did not know that. Okay. Um, and so there's a lot of things that uh, you will learn in this interview. I, I want to say this too. Um, I met Pierce Morgan several years ago uh, when he came to Iowa for the caucuses and had me on his show when he was on CNN. And our family used to be, as the kids got older, we don't watch it as much anymore. But when kids were younger, we were huge America's Got Talent fans. And, you know, Anastasia, our oldest daughter's favorite judge, was Pierce Morgan, which probably doesn't surprise you because he was the most blunt, you know. And so I brought her to the interview with me, and um, uh, he was kind enough to take a picture with her and give her a shout out. It was very, very kind. All right. So um, I, I, w I was impressed that Pier the, the th here's the thing that stood out to me the most, actually, in the interview. Is Pierce Morgan brought up what he said to De what he said about what DeSantis was doing and the way he was aggressively reopening his state, and that he had said Pierce Morgan said, "Hey, you're going to have blood on your hands for what you're doing." He said that right to DeSantis's face and said, "Hey, looking at the data and the excess deaths and everything else, I was wrong about that, and I need to own that." Don't see that a lot, regardless of ideology or worldview. Not a lot of people around here in this line of work, willing to admit they were wrong about anything, but instead want to gaslight you or memory hole you as if that never occurred. All right. So I just, I wanted to make sure that I, I mentioned that. Let's get to the interview in and of itself. What did you think of it? Aaron, I'll start with you. So one of the things that stood out to me was how chummy Piers Morgan seemed to be with, uh, with Ron DeSantis and actually upbeat because that's not the Piers Morgan, at least that I remember but then again maybe he is more of a, a classical actual journalist than what I'm, I'm thinking but that that was one thing that that stood out to me um seemed to be I, I watched I watched the edited full hour and then I listened to about uh, half three quarters of the unedited version and um I, I felt like there were quite a few diffusions in terms of foreign policy 
that uh, Ron DeSantis had. So that was one thing that I was a little bit disappointed by. One thing that I really, really liked when we got into the name calling, what the left is calling him, what Donald Trump thinks of him. He impressively pivoted every time to, I don't really care about that. It's about the people. You, you heard that a couple of times just in those two clips, especially at the end there. I see myself as a vessel for the aspirations of the people that I represent. That's called being a what? A statesman. And so I, I think he did that pretty deftly during the course of, of that interview. The rest of the stuff, I mean, uh, some of his family life, as you mentioned there, didn't, hadn't heard about that. It's kind of uh, kind of gives you a little bit more of a perspective. He is not the most charismatic person, but he's not a Ben Carson either. He can hold his own in a conversation and not bore you to death. Sorry, Ben Carson. So, I, I you know, I, I think he's just fine interpersonally. He has, I mean, he didn't know. I'm sure he had some idea what questions were coming, but off the cuff... He seemed to do just fine. He seemed to do just fine. I think you had a very astute uh, observation there on the foreign policy stuff, because you, when you watch the interview in total, you will see there is a there is a different level of instant conviction in his answers on everything except when Pierce Morgan asks him, what's the end game in Ukraine? And you can tell that's either one that he either doesn't want to say what the end game in Ukraine likely is or doesn't maybe know. He knows, okay? he, in fairness to him, he probably knows that the that the military industrial complex and neocons are going to require some sort of blood oath mm -hmm. at some point during this process. So I don't know. Shannon, what say you? agree with you guys on that assessment. It, I thought it was a great interview. There were certainly areas that I would have loved to see explored, particularly the vaccines, the COVID-19 vaccines and the rollout of uh, the vaccines, what we're learning now about the toxic nature and um, just the, the devastating impact on humanity. To me, that is still the single most important issue that we are facing today. It's everything and it's going to be everything agree with you on in that. the next two to three weeks. Surprise. He didn't pivot to that when given the chance because he's really the only candidate in this race that has any credibility on it whatsoever. I think he missed well, an opportunity to pivot to that. I agree with you. Yeah. Well, in that theme, that theme dovetail, dovetails with what Aaron said regarding kind of backing away on the rec Ukraine issue as well. So those are two third rail issues, right? The military industrial complex and the medical industrial complex. And he's not ready to answer those yet. And so looking at that interview, I'm coming away with it feeling like my answer, my questions are not all answered, but the, the largest theme that I, that I saw in that interview that I, I really appreciated. And I actually think this is the reason that he's a contender. And this is the reason that Donald Trump is deploying his operatives right now all over the country to do as much damage to DeSantis early on as possible. What came through in that interview, number one was uh, courage, right? The willingness to stand up and do things, especially in one of the, the worst times in United States history, which was 2002, do things that are very unpopular and, and continue to stand up for those principles. He came off as very authentic very real, unscripted. There was there weren't a lot of notes. It wasn't taglines. And, um, you know, so there was an authenticity there that I think is going to be the new commodity in marketing in the next few years. That's going to be meaningful to a lot of people. And he, he came off as safe and stable, right? So it is essentially the anti-Trump. He is the complete opposite of Donald Trump, the candidate. And he comes off in a way that might not satisfy MAGA Republicans in the alt-right or the uber-right, but especially given the fact that his first interview was with Pierce Morgan, which would be a seemingly left-leaning person, this type of appeal, I think, could cross over easily, easily into uh, the Democrat Party and reasoned um, you know, constitutional liberals. So he's a huge threat. He's a, definitely a contender. And if I were 
if I were consulting with him, I would say, listen, don't do anything but govern. Continue to govern, make bold moves. Don't get dragged into the fray. File your papers when you need to file them. Raise money when you need to raise money. But I would just stay the course. I would also advise him, though, to make a bold move on vaccines. That would be the one thing that would propel him. It would take Trump out of the headlines. It would make that issue very clear to the American people. And I think it would be impactful. It would rally a base that we've never seen before in the United States of America. So that's what I would say. I thought also, Todd, fascinating, the choice of the interview with Pierce Morgan, who has had had a very close and and chummy relationship with Donald Trump for several years. Mm -hmm. Um, And in the last few years, Pierce Morgan, I guess I would say he's been Joe Rogan to Russell Branded a little bit. You remember, he lost his job with the BBC because he refused to acknowledge that men uh, that men can become women. Mm -hmm. He just refused to go along with that charade. Okay, and he got fired from the BBC for that, you know. So I think um, I, I think if you are I know a lot of people like Pierce Morgan in my personal life. I know a lot of people like Pierce Morgan professionally that would love an excuse to vote for somebody that on the Republican side that they typically would not do because they think the country has gone insane. Right. And they are hoping and praying Ron DeSantis can beat Trump in the primary. So they have the excuse to do that because they'll never vote for Trump because they just don't think he'll do anything to stop uh, how insane the process is. Now, I, I don't give a rip about that crap. I just want to know if Trump's a better leader than Joe Biden. But I know a lot of people a lot of them that would would strongly consider voting for a Republican for the first time if DeSantis was nominated instead of Donald Trump. But what were your thoughts on the views on I was, the interview, Todd? I was thinking a lot about the choice of Pierce Morgan before watching any of it. And uh, it this has a lot to do with the courage and authenticity uh, that Shannon's talking about. I, I totally agree. And he knew that if he went into that interview and it, it ended up being quite chummy, Mm -hmm. some pointed questions, but had it gone more aggressive, I think still he would have known at the end of the day, this is a guy I can have those beers with, like he talked about in the Irish pub. We can Mm -hmm. have Guinnesses. Mm -hmm. They're kind of the same guys. They're passionate. Mm -hmm. We'll be aggressive. Mm -hmm. We'll go at it. Instead of falling into some ridiculous MSNBC interview with the chick across from you who speaks with dulcet tones, but is passive aggressive the entire time, and then you're just a mansplainer or some nonsense like that, he said... DeSantis is telling you, I am not afraid of hard questions at all. And if you right. think I am by choosing him, you're crazy. But we're going to do this. And, I, and if it got into a scrum, it would look like two dudes having a very important conversation. So uh, that speaks to the, uh, again, those words are important, courage and authenticity. I, I can't say that. No. Ron DeSantis, whatever else you think of uh, him, right. he's, he's, he's different. He knows who he is at a more important time than ever in our adult lives when you have to know that. Let's get to the exit question. And, and this is really early, man. Just shooting from the hip. Don't feel compelled to be held to this. If the odds Ron DeSantis will be given the acceptance speech at the nomination for the nomination at the 2024 GOP convention, based on what you think just right now, um, if they were a number one song from the 1980s, which 1980s number one song would it be? A, I Can't Go For That by Hall & Oates. B, Against All Odds by Phil Collins. C, Nothing's Gonna Stop Us Now by Jefferson Starship. Or D, How Will I Know by Whitney Houston. Shannon. Gotta go with How Will I Know by Whitney Houston. Okay. Aaron, what say you? The ones, uh, the one that the odds are against that I'm still maintaining Trump is going to win just because we can't have nice things. And that's my only, that's literally my only analysis. So, so. you're, you're more, I can't go for that. Oh, I can't go for that. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Well, I bet you, you could, you can't could interpret up. against all odds, I guess, yep. both ways. Yep. But, and it's a better yep. song. Okay. No, oh, it's a great song, which makes yep. me want to pick it no matter what we're talking about. <laughs> but Shannon is correct. How will I know is the right answer. I think there are a lot of variables at play here. Yeah. A lot. Um, you have um, you have several legal issues that Trump has to mire his way through. I would not rule out whatsoever that they find some federal judge somewhere um, that says he's not constitutionally eligible to run. Uh, the question goes to uh, the Supreme Court, and you know I don't know that you can trust them to rule correctly and something like that. I just, I just think there are a lot of variables at play here right now. All right, we'll come back. 
Let's talk about ban and stuff and whether in the case of TikTok, it would truly make us safer or not. We'll do that and more in a moment. During the break, I was just looking at uh, the interior. We are just about to send it off to the printers. We have a certain amount of special edition copies of A Nefarious Plot, my 2016 book that inspired the movie that comes out three weeks from today. The film Nefarious, it's theaters nationwide, three weeks from today. And if you want to get a special edition of the book, A Nefarious Plot, that ties into the film with a brand new cover that includes the poster to the movie and it's autographed by yours truly, you can get, we got a few hundred of those left right now at nefariousbook.com again you want to head over to nefariousbook.com those will be shipping later in april may Uh, if you want them for mother's day or father's day gifts you should be able to get them by then nefariousbook.com is where you want to go all right let's continue on with our good friend shannon joy here as we take a look at the week that was here in what's left of western civilization let us get to issue three should we ban tiktok TikTok has been a topic of conversation this week. A group of about 30 influencers gathered with a few Democrat politicians at the Capitol to protest a proposed ban to the Chinese-owned social media app. Here's what Congressman Bowman of New York had to say. Republicans ain't got no swag. That's why they want to ban ban TikTok. (laughs) Republicans ain't got no swag. That's the problem. Congress is indeed debating a bill that would give Joe Biden the authority to ban the app and website, citing national security concerns. TikTok CEO Sho Chu testified in front of a House panel yesterday. How, how can you promise that uh, that that will move into uh, into the United States of America and be protected here? Uh, Congressman, I have seen no evidence that the Chinese government has access to that data. They have never asked us. We have not provided. Well, you know what? I've I asked that, that I find that actually preposterous. I have uh, looked in. I have seen no evidence of this happening. Of course, TikTok is indeed owned by the Shycom, so I guess if you're somebody whose data isn't owned by Google or Facebook, that's a problem. On the other hand, if you follow libs of TikTok on Twitter and elsewhere, TikTok has actually been a valuable tool in outing what lefties and spirit of the agers actually believe. We'll see if Biden opts to ban the app, even if given the power. Recently, TikTok signed a PR group with close ties to alums of the Biden White House. All right, so I'll, I'm going to start with my view, and then I want all of you to, t- to tell me if you think I'm nuts or you agree, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, I think this is a demonic platform that has almost no um, intrinsic cultural moral value whatsoever, none. I think it's a total spiritual loss leader. However... I am highly suspicious of a bunch of people who have not seemed all that concerned about our national security for many, many years. Now want to ban this app. And this app didn't just become an instrument for the Shycoms to collect your data, your data last week or last month. This has been the case from its inception more than likely. That's probably its actual purpose. On the other hand, I promise you, courtesy of Google and everybody else who are complete simps for the Shycoms, they already have all your data anyway. They already have all your data anyway. So to me, the national security risk actually isn't the data. The national security risk is that you're allowing the Shycoms to ingest this cultural rot gut into our ecosystem. That's the national security risk. And what it does to demoralize and influence and despiritualize and and nihilize our young people. That's the national security risk, not the data. Your data's already gone, man. You're on the dark web 70,000 times. Come on now. Let's not pee on each other and say that it's raining here. That being said, though, it has also provided us a valuable outlet. How many of these groomer teachers have been outed, fired, forced to resign? That would not have otherwise been if not for the fact that this app gives them a platform to parade their demonic crazy. So I don't think that this is as cut and dried as maybe it's being presented. But what say you? Todd, I'll start with you this time. Uh, Well, you know, it should be called Narcissists Are Us. I mean, that's what this really is. It's not close to being the fundamental 
causal issue of anything, which is why I can actually take it or leave it. And quite frankly, the only thing I disagree with that you said there, has it caught some people, Steve? But yes, but because of the existence of TikTok right now, this goes to what I said about the church. We should have the revolution should be over. The parental evolution revolution Mm -hmm. should have, you know, been a uh, force of good totally changing the structure of schools drag train story hours should simply not exist anymore are we mm-hmm. close to any of that happening david french is on today actually arguing once again that if you're against drag queen story hour you you support viewpoint discrimination yeah i do on a lot of things tiktok might just be the start of it i'd be banning all hella things that are from the devil so listen this is banning tiktok one way or the other is it, this it, this is giving false comfort, quite frankly, to give this too much credence, because if we based on the mirror that that is held up to our culture, we we should have had the most monumental last two years in all of human history in terms of how people took back their civilization. We have not come close to what needs to be done. So I just don't think this hmm. is a a leading issue. It's a symptom Fair point. Aaron, what do you think? I think that's right on the money. I also think that my uh, the modus operandi when it comes to this story, and this has been bandied about now since I think the last year of the Trump presidency. So mm-hmm. this has been around for years We've been talking now. about banning it for three or four years. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of a red flag right away. It's like if it's that pro- important to national security, probably should have banned it when we first started thinking about banning it. My modus operandi with this... All of these people in the swamp, what do they want on both both sides of the political aisle? Power and control. Power and control. It's really hard to do that over a, over a platform with, what, 100 million users, something like that? It's in the tens of millions of users, at least. Really hard to exercise power and control over a company, a platform that large that's based in China. Yeah. So, you let YouTube, you let Instagram get a little market foothold in the vertical video uh, business. You let them both pour a bunch of marketing money to advertise their YouTube shorts and Instagram reels. Let them get into the market just a little bit. Ban TikTok so that your sensors are closer to home, whom you have more control over. Now, having said that, that little nugget at the end of the story, I don't think that Joe Biden is going to ban this, even if given the power. And I think he is going to be given the power to do so by Congress. I don't think he's going to ban it because we've got a lot of, I mean, if there's anything, I mean, what was the story we just had a week and a half ago? Family members of the Bidens on the payroll of a business partner taking money directly from a CCP aligned business in China. He loves him some Chinese money. So I don't think he's actually going to, to ban it. But that's my modus operandi. This is not about national security. This is about having power and control and having, and it's hard to do that, exercise that power and control over a company and a platform that's based and owned by an overseas company. That's all. Hmm. Fascinating perspective there. Shannon, what do you think? I think, you know, this is a classic limited hangout, right? So it's a PR tactic. Everything about this is PR. So they, they have an agenda, they want to put forth a narrative. And the limited hangout is actually hilarious. It was actually first coined out of the Nixon administration when they were trying to uh, you know cover up the reality of what was going on. And the, the conversation is funny as it's recounted. They're like, well, should we let it all hang out? And they're like, no, no, it's like a limited hangout. It's basically when you lose control of a narrative, you then, deflect by looking at, you know, a very small portion of what happened. So you let out the truth a little bit. What's the truth? It is the problem of the Communist Party, the Chinese Communist Party infiltration into the United States of America in a variety of different ways. In this case, it's through TikTok and they're gathering up information, but that pales in comparison to what the NSA is gobbling up. And to your point, Steve, Google and Facebook, you name it. 
And so when you distract everyone, you seemingly solve a problem to mm -hmm. Aaron's point by banning TikTok, you're still collecting the information, but you can go back to your constituents and say, we took care of it. You can go back and you can look at the narrative and say, yeah, we, you know, we identified this, we addressed it, and now we're going to move on. But the, the remaining um, elephant in the room remains. And, you know, if anyone reads Epic Times, which is one of my favorite papers of record, the problem of the problem of communist China is, I mean, way bigger than TikTok. The 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 amount of infiltration into the right. United States of America. I mean, in, you're, to in your point with the limited hangout, they're buying up our farmland and we're concerned about TikTok. Exactly. Correct. Right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. So let's get to the exit question then. Will TikTok be banned this year, Todd? No. Shannon. Yes. Aaron. No. 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 Which brings us to our kicker question, issue four. What platform would you unilaterally ban if you could? Can I go first? You may. And why? Yes. I'm going to, I'm going to piss uh, the blaze brass off here. Daily Wire. Eliminate the competition. That's really good for us. <laughs> I totally wow. self-serving. That's a that's a strong play. I did not see that one coming, man. Uh, the opinions expressed by Aaron my McIntyre producer didn't kill himself. Do not necessarily <laughs> represent the program as a whole. Okay, particularly should the Blaze not renew my next contract and I need a new platform. All right, but uh, that was hilarious. All right. <laughs> I expected like really serious answers. Aaron comes out of the box with a very self-serving oh. one. Everyone, that's not us. Yeah. yeah okay, go ahead. And um, I had a circumstance yesterday, an experience with this that, but and it echoes what I said about a month ago. But like whatever you you would have to tell me what it is, but whatever the largest talk platform in sports there is, not actual games, mm -hmm. whatever the talk get. It has to go. It's making men so impossibly stupid. I almost Dude, drove my car into a I lake yesterday listening to something. We I can't. We can't. TikTok. Screw TikTok. TikTok is nothing compared to what sports radio is doing to our men. Dude, Give us an example. I what do you mean? Just a second, Aaron. What do you mean? It, speaking of narcissists, these guys, these guys, they can't even. They're talking about their their entire lives, entire lives. Their mm -hmm. emotional status revolves around. I, I can't. I just can't. There, can I can I give an even better example, yeah. kind of fictitiously? But uh, Jack Posobiec has been on one when it comes to artificial intelligence images yeah. and things like that. Yeah. He posted one of the Chinese Communist Party taking over Times Square the other day, a video of it, or I think a couple of screenshots. It looks very realistic. I thought of you, Todd, when I saw that, because I thought, you know, the very next morning after that, something like that happens, I can totally see local sports talk radio around here, or maybe it's a national program that you and I, I think, have both listened to a little bit, getting on air the next morning and saying, of course, uh, you know, the big question after the news in uh, Times Times Square yesterday and the Chinese Communist Party takeover. How does that affect the Super Bowl? Yeah. And yeah, that's what you're talking about. Okay. Shannon, if you could ban a platform, unilaterally ban it, what would it be? Someone needs to put the networks out of their misery. I mean, the big ones. I get my nails done every two weeks and uh, they have the big TVs right in front. It's always around like six o'clock. So I'm subjected to the CBS six o'clock news or the ABC six o'clock news. And they're almost becoming a parody of themselves. Like the, all of the report, it is so bad. It is so scripted. They're so dumb that they, I mean, I'm laughing through it. People think I'm a terrible person, but the networks are awful awful it's hunger games hunger Games style report i don't know if you guys have watched like caesar it, flickerman like everybody caesar it flickerman is, is what you're saying it's painful to yeah. watch it, it's painful to watch and so yeah get let's get rid of the networks no one watches it, it, anyway. it it's pbs npr for me start with start with something yeah. easy we're not subsidizing this anymore yeah. All right. If y'all, if you can find people that so desperately need Joy Reid's perspective on the air and Don Lemon's perspective on the air that they are willing to shell out money out of their own pocket to buy up advertising for you to have revenue, even though there's almost no one watching, fine. But we're not subsidizing our own Tokyo Roses anymore. We're getting rid of that stuff. All right. So it would be NPR and PBS for me. All right. Let us get to predictions. Shannon, you're first. Go ahead. 
I'm going to do my same prediction as last time because it is also a projection on Teron DeSantis. Um, I want to see a bold move. I think that we should uh, see Florida make a move to ban the COVID-19 vaccines or at least pull them from the market. Okay. I mean, they've done everything for the, to the vaccine other than that in Florida. Yeah. That would be the most yeah. logical step. Maybe that would be something that following whatever this grand jury comes up with. I mean, if you look, if you listen to the statement Dr. Latipo made last week during the state to state state of the state address that uh, DeSantis gave, I mean, he was basically setting the stage for something like this. I mean, it sounded like a, yeah. a monologue from this show, frankly. Todd, go ahead. Yeah. Well, one of my predictions a while back did come true this week, and it's it's only going to be happening more now. Uh, St. Francis College, a D1 program in the same small conference as. Um, Plucky fairly Dickinson, who you may have heard, has now said at the end of this year, no more sports. It's it, what you are going to now have is you you're just going to have a, a top tier of Division One, and then it'll continue to exist at a D two and a D three level and something like that. But that we are creating an unsustainable model. And Sounds like soccer though, right? With mm-hmm. relegation and stuff, I think you'd be more in favor of that, right? This is not relegation. This is uh, d- taking sports out of the intent. It was part of a holistic educational endeavor. We're getting it wrong on every front, by the way. Educationally, we're screwing that part up, too. But this is the, the this, this is not relegation. This is, again, sports radio. We are creating a culture where this is an idol. And we all damn well know it, too. But we just love it too much. I love it, too. But I'm not turning it into in my idol. Aaron. Totally agree with that. Totally, totally agree. Sports idolatry is terrible. My prediction is neither UCL, I'm sorry, neither UConn nor Creighton nor can, uh, <laughs> Alabama nor Houston are going to win the NCAA tournament. I knew as soon as uh, that Gonzaga dude hit that 500 foot three last night, none of my other futures tickets are going to actually pan through. But yeah, good comments, Todd. <laughs> That's. Walk off home run, Aaron McIntyre. I am going to make a sports prediction, too, on the heels of what Todd said. I'm going to predict that both the NCAA basketball tournaments and hockey tournaments are won by interim coaches. Uh, Brandon Narado, the interim coach at the University of Michigan, I think they'll win the hockey tournament. And he took over because the previous coach got caught basically trying to cheat uh, COVID regulations. Um, and so he's an interim coach. And then you have Rodney Terry, the interim coach at the University of Texas who took over because of whatever the story was with Chris Beard. Did he, did he assault his fiance? She, she called the cops and apparently said it didn't happen. And now he's going to be the coach. I, I don't know, but Rodney Terry has been the interim coach there. I saw the way they played up close and personal when they were here in Des Moines last week, a lot of good looking athletes and they play together. Well, so I think both major NCAA tournaments this spring get won by coaches that are interim at their respective schools, Texas and Michigan. Thank you, Shannon. Appreciate it as always. We'll come back with Hour 2 and Feedback Friday here in a moment. All right, back here with Hour 2, live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast. Steve Dace here with Aaron McIntyre, Todd Erzin, and all of you. And you can let us know what you think about what we think. Via the SteveDace.com inbox. Email us, steve at stevedace.com. That's D E A C E. Like us on Facebook, MeWe, and Gab. Follow me at Steve Dace Show on Twitter, Getter, Instagram, and yes, TikTok. That's D E A C E. You can also look for me on Truth Social. You got to really look there. At Real Steve Dace on Truth Social, at Real Steve Dace there. And don't forget, if you're a podcast listener, if you have yet to do this, please consider leaving us a five-star review, uh, hit subscribe or follow if that's what they offer you on your podcast platform of choice. And thank you to all of you, thousands of you that have done those things for us already. We appreciate each and every one. I know the management of the blaze, they, they do as well. So thank you. Uh, we were talking last hour about all the concern regarding TikTok and the the, chi, the Shycoms may get our data when who who we kidding? They already got it from Apple and, and Google and everybody already because they're all simps for the Shycoms anyway, right? Meanwhile, they're buying up our farmland and like no one says a word, right? So you know what happens? They buy up a lot of if, if your farmland is a lot of the food that comes from the farm ends up being Chinese owned. That's why you want to look at our friends over at Moink. Uh, they do things the way the generations who built and preserved this country for us to now ruin. 
Uh, the way they, they used to do things. Farm to table food, uh, including grass fed and grass finished beef and lamb, pastured pork and chicken, sustainable wild caught Alaskan salmon and more. All of it delivered straight to your door and you can't beat it, uh, including some of the best bacon you've ever tasted. And they will throw in a great deal for you. When you go to moinkbox.com slash Steve, you choose the meat delivered in every box, whether it's ribeyes, chicken breasts, pork chops, salmon fillets, or more, and you get free bacon in your first box. Free bacon in your first box, the nectar of the gods. When you go to moinkbox.com slash Steve, M-O-I-N-K, moinkbox.com slash Steve. All right, you guys ready for some Feedback Friday? You bet. Let's right. do it. Let us begin with Ken and Amanda Barton, who say, while we greatly appreciate Dr. Atlas's article and his list of the top 10 COVID stand prevarications that you guys shared earlier this week, we have to assert that he missed maybe the two most egregious ones. And the reason why is, had these two particular truths been disseminated accurately, the number of lost lives could have been saved are virtually immeasurable number one hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin are not only effective but very well may be harmful or not only ineffective but very well may be harmful and they go on to say the countless numbers of people around the globe whose lives could have been spared make this in and of itself one of the most insidious crimes against humanity ever and and it's not just uh, the barton uh, ken and amanda barton saying this remember last september i i still think that is the most viral video this show has ever produced the interview that we did with Dr. Dr. Harvey Risch, mm-hmm. renowned epidemiologist at Yale University, one of the most academically cited epidemiologists in all of American history. And I asked him, what was the biggest lie of the last few years? And what did he select? That. This one. This one right here. And the amount of people, he said, whose lives could have otherwise been saved. He singled this lie out. So that's not just coming from me or, you know... Uh, other people who, you know, God bless Dr. Ryan Cole, who's a Mayo Clinic, Mayo trained pathologist, but maybe you've never heard of a guy that, you know, works out of his own lab in Idaho before. Fine. How about the guy who has had over 10,000 academic citations around the world in his career from Yale University? Is that guy good enough for you? Should Should be. Yeah. Uh, they go on to say, in fact, when one considers the vast and ever increasing, or I'm sorry, um, If you couple this with the necessity of the emergency youth authorization rules as it applies to the propagation of the vaccines, we can think of no other scheme in the history of humanity which even holds a candle to the promulgation of COVID tyranny. I agree. Completely agree. This is why it is my primary focus in vetting this presidential primary. I know some of you want me to let it go. What kind of host would I be? What kind of integrity would I have? If much of what people know about this show, we kind of had a, a a small, loyal, deep, deeply embedded, hidden gem audience prior to COVID. The work we did on COVID the last few years and the leadership of, of shows like this one and a rare number of others took and blew our audience into the stratosphere. That'll be, the, I hope it's the most important work we ever do because If we do more important work, it's because something worse than that actually happened. I hope it's the most important work we ever do. I hope this book to my right here is the most that you see with the noose around it. I hope it is the the most important book that I have ever written. It is right now. I hope that remains the case. I hope nothing else I ever write is more important than Rise of the Fourth Reich because that would mean something worse than what they did to us these last few years has been allowed to occur once more. And, and the only reason I would let it go and just not hold people accountable to it is because it's good for my business to do that. It's good for business to do it. There would be no actual wit and reason of integrity or character that I would. It would just be craven. That's why I'm not going to do that. And we're absolutely going to use our platform Not just this show, but the entire Iowa caucus process that will be at our disposal here in the next 10 months. To get some answers. 
or at least ask the right questions. Because there is nothing. 9-11, guys, the NFL took a week off. And we went right back to watching football and going to football games two weeks later after 9-11. There is nothing, almost the entire generation that remembers Pearl Harbor has passed away. There's not much of the greatest generation left. There is nothing in well over 90% of this country in our lifetimes that more threatened our way of life and put it on the brink of extinction than COVID did. And more specifically, the policies, the heinous, immoral, not to mention stupid policies that it inspired. Hell no, I'm not letting it go. Not until there's justice. They go on to say that the vaccines are safe and effective. It is clear the global statist machine attempted to create a virus that would significantly, significantly reduce the population of planet Earth if it isn't a depopulation scheme. Okay, fine. Let's say, let's say that it was a purposeful depopulation scheme. How would they have behaved any differently right. than they already have? What, what behavior would they have done differently if it is one? It is no less clear that they intended the cure to be the icing on the cake. In fact, when one considers the vast and ever-increasing amount of information coming available almost daily, a person capable of critical thinking must give a reasonable credence to the idea that the cure was the original sin and the COVID-19 virus was created as the catalyst to introduce the real agent of death that the vaccination turned out to be. Guys, there's, if you do the math, we've done that on this show. There's over a thousand percent better odds that you will suffer a major adverse event from the COVID vaccine than you will die of COVID-19. Like from the very beginning of the virus, if you did the math all the way through, it's something like a thousand sixty six percent greater likelihood you suffer an ad, a major adverse event from the vaccine than you would die of COVID. Steve, what about hospitalizations? Two and a half percent. That's the number. Two and a half percent of people who suffered, who tested positive for COVID ended up in hospitals. Two and a half percent. They go on to say, don't always agree with you guys, but damn sure appreciate your candor, your passion and your conviction. My best to you guys. That's very well put both to Ken and Amanda Barton. Thank you for that. Having met uh scott atlas in person uh in november at the informed choices event i will say he was asked questions like this and he he addressed them he didn't uh uh blow them off in any way shape or form uh i i just will say this about the medical community look, look at if anybody was going to set this kind of stuff down and reevaluate it. It's a guy like Scott Atlas. So look, look at the bullets he took from the beginning on this. Absolutely. But this is why I talk about the magical power of vaccines. Hardly anybody in the medical industry, really, relative to the gravity of the situation that Steve just laid out, which is accurate. Again, it should have been I should have been open everywhere. We should have, you, doctors everywhere should have had the Doctor Strange moment. Show me everything. We're not even close to anything like that happening because I can't, it is, it is otherworldly to, to simply say, you don't even learn about vaccination as a doctor. Mm hmm can you uh, the immune system that you actually just take that for granted they they'll tell you this mm -hmm. we don't just like as oh by the way if you go to law school there's not even a class on the constitution yeah, you just it's, read what other people it's write the about same it. damn thing yeah. you're just told this is the flat earth believe it and they've been believing it for a very long time you you are asking men of medicine who have made a lot of money and are comfortable with the living to turn it totally upside down these are human beings like anybody else. I'm, I'm not making excuses for them. I'm the last person to do that. I'm just trying to convince you how hard this is going to be to give up this paradigm that has been a lie that makes a lot of people rich and powerful. That's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. It's going to be even hard for people like Scott. The fact, I will tell you, the fact that it happened to my friend and my boss, Steve Dace, is one of the greatest gifts of my life because I knew in 2020, if this breaks a different way, I probably have to get a different job 
Thank God he had the integrity and the gifts to see through this BS from the beginning. He, it was not easy. It's not easy for anybody. I feel like I was blessed with the miracle that I found out the way I did through marriage, who I married. But this is a lie that people clench very, very tightly. Do not be surprised when anybody tries a way to navigate it right now because this, you accept this, your world will and must be turned upside down. The reality is, it's, it, everything you just said is so true. Everything is. We used to call them on our show, and again, because our show has grown so much the last few years, maybe some of the, the stuff that was fundamental to our program pre-COVID and in our analysis you've not heard us reference before, we used to call these squirrels from the movie Up. I'm a huge fan of the movie Up. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's like one of the greatest romantic comedies like of the last, of the 21st century. You'd be right. It's a great movie. Right? The dog that with the, with the thing on his throat, squirrel, all right, who talks but gets instantly distracted. There are certain things you can say that even if they are true, detract from everything else you're trying to say because it's a level of truth people aren't ready to hear exactly yet. Exactly right. And it detracts from everything else that you bring up. If Scott Atlas writes that entire piece for Newsweek and at the very yes, end this is my mentions point. either hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin or the vaccine, then every previous word that he wrote gets called into, gets immediately dismissed. Now, you can say... And we're talking about a guy that went into the belly of the beast yes. of, the, of the Jared Kushner, not Trump, the Jared Kushner, Debbie Burke's White House itself, man, and laid down ordinance and called fire from heaven, Elijah style. OK, so I am not going to sit here and Monday morning quarterback Scott Atlas from that perspective. All right. But it is a lot easier for me as a kid who barely made it out of community college that no one academically respects to say these things than someone who carries with them the heft and the weight and the banner of Stanford University, and they're looking to cancel you at every yes. turn. That's why Harvey Rich saying it with an even more esteemed banner, Yale University, is worthy of, of, of lauding. And that's an area where he had, Harvey Rich didn't go into the belly of the beast, probably would have if he was invited, but he wasn't. DeSantis did, or I'm sorry. Atlas did go into the, the belly of the beast and will forever have a certain amount of uh, respect and reverence for me as a result. And so in the arena that he was Absolutely. called in, he went in there and fired every truth bullet he had. We also didn't have a vaccine in the summer and fall of 2020. And we didn't have, we were just beginning to actually learn about ivermectin at that period of time. It wasn't really until, what was it, uh, October, November, December? No, it's December, I think, is when Pierre Corey actually gave his first testimony, December of 2020, to the Senate subcommittee on ivermectin. And so by then, Atlas was already out of the White House, okay? Uh, but so then you turn around and you thank Harvey Risch. You know, that it, it, it's similar to, you know, it takes a body, as the good book says, you know? Some people are, and, and Atlas had his gift, which was to go into the White House. And then Harvey Risch comes and, mm -hmm. and supplements and provides his gift with the courage that he has shown on the other matter involving early treatment, which, by the way, is also more of his MO, all right? Scott Atlas is more of a, uh, he was, I think his background is radiology and medical practice, mm -hmm. and he's largely been a medical theoretician and academician. Risch is an actual MD, with, that, that treats patients. And so when you get into early, uh, we, the early treatment stuff, he's far more qualified to discuss it both academically and also personally and experientially than, than Scott Atlas is, right? But this also brings up, uh, I, we, we got so busy last week, we didn't even talk about this. There is a preprint study at researchgate.com out of Australia that estimates, now keep in mind, 95% of Aussies 16 and over have taken a full, at least one full dosage of the gene juice, the, po the poison poke. It finds 41,369 excess deaths since the rollout of the vaccine in Australia. 41,369 excess deaths. If you were to prorate that to the U.S. population, you would be at 534,000 deaths excess deaths right about where people like ethical skeptic and others that have been going into this data what they are estimating based on what they're saying from our own cdc Five hundred and thirty-four thousand excess deaths as a result of the covid jabs Five hundred and thirty-four thousand. 
And remember, it was a number roughly that size that we just saw earlier in the week when Aaron rolled the tape on the montage of Dr. Fauci going through inner city DC. Right. This is why you have to get vaccinated. Right. That number is scary. Well, that number only happened if it happened at all because you withheld ivermectin and it gave people terrible advice at the beginning. Yet it's really happening here. Yet everybody can't even like they just nope nope it's the monkeys ears closed eyes closed which makes my point you're I, I'm so glad you brought this up because it puts a number on what I was saying about how just people simply cannot bring themselves to say this is real and I don't and, go ahead Aaron on that note I, I think fundamentally the conflict that is going on obviously is a spiritual one but fundamentally the conflict that is going on in this country that speaks to that attitude, Todd, is on one side, a relatively small group of people who are just demonically seething 24-7. And then the rest of America, whether it's just useful idiots or people who uh, just you know believe like we do but can't be bothered, basically people who just want to be left alone or just want to get back to normal. It's Oron McIntyre's axiom, the side that wants to win always beats the side that just wants to be left alone. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, that is the conflict, if there is one at all, in our country right now. We should have had that moment. We should have had, guys, we should have had 15 come to Jesus moments just in the last year and a half or two years. But no, we just want to be left alone for one reason or another. That looks like a number of things. I don't want to admit I was wrong. I don't want to admit what they actually did. I might be a ticking time bomb. I might be a ticking time bomb. I don't want to admit what they did. Therefore, I'm just going to cover my it's the it's the Cornelius Fudge effect from Harry Potter. If you get the uh, analogy, there are a ton of people out there like that and that just for whatever reason want to bury their head in the sand. And meanwhile, the demonic seed goes on one way or another this is different the difference between the fourth reich and the third reich is there was there was a select not every german imposed upon their neighbors the edicts of the third reich now the vast majority of them were silent when their jewish neighbors were hauled off they were complicit by omission they showed no courage of conviction and, uh, and, and were willing to, uh, for the fatherland, they were willing to look the other way and pretend like it wasn't happening. So that's, so they're, they were culpable. They were culprit. They were enablers, but they weren't the culprits. Their hands aren't on the actual weapon. In the Fourth Reich, all of us are guilty. We all put masks on ourselves or our kids. Less than 15% of American adults didn't take any of this poison poke or gene juice. This is, this is, this, this, this level of corruption dripped down on a house to house, family to family basis. There isn't a family or home in America that is immune from it in some respects. And it simply is not human nature. It, it is human nature to say, fine, I'll hold other people accountable if you make me. Not so much human nature to say, I'll hold myself accountable. I think there's a lot of people who don't want to think, I'm the person whose sperm motility is ruined. I'll never father children. So I don't even want to think about it. Let's just move on. I'm the woman who, um, whose menstrual cycles are destroyed. And if I get pregnant, I'll, I'm, I'm just a miscarriage waiting to happen. So let's just move on. We're not, and we moved on, Steve. We're not taking any more of it. Look at the numbers. We all know what's going on. Everybody's aware and we're going to move on. I understand that. I promise you though, if you just move on, they will do it again. Because the Joker was right. It was all part That's of the right. plan. Everybody, ma- mask up, lock down. We're all in this together. It's all part of the plan. But you say once... That getting, not getting vaccinating is the road I'm going to go down. I'll take my chances that way. People lose their minds because they can't even fathom that as a choice, as an alternative. This is this also, I think, is a good point I need to bring up as it involves the Trump DeSantis race. And this is where I have made a mistake and should have articulated this more clearly. Because I, I hear from some of you, well, DeSantis issued a stay-at-home order. DeSantis initially rolled out the, the vaccines. Those things are all true. 
I mean, we live in one of the only yep. states in the country that didn't have a stay at home stay at home order. Now, originally, DeSantis didn't have a stay at home order. Remember, they left the beaches open yep. and everything else, and he got so much heat that finally he actually didn't issue his stay at home order in March like everybody else did. He issued his in April. He got so much heat that he finally said, "Fine, all right, let's stop having the spring breakers and everything else. We'll issue one." I think they issued it like April seventh, and on April twenty ninth is when he lifted the stay at home order and began reopening the state on May one. But they have a different seasonality issue that you've pointed out regularly. But there's there's another thing here too, though, humility. Yeah, for sure. Ron DeSantis made several mistakes. He turned away. He 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 owned up to the mistakes. Oh, the jab doesn't work. Oh, it's got side effects. All right, get rid of my medical director, and I'm going to hire one of America's frontline doctors. Joe Latipo was one of the original frontline doctors. I'm handing this off to somebody I know will tell me the truth. Oh wait, we don't need to lock down. We don't have full hospitals. So I listened. I let you. I I, I buckled and let and let listen to Fauci in the White House and the Trump White House and tell me to lock down. I don't know what I'm doing. We're not doing that anymore. He put down the shovel and climbed out. Correct. Trump won't do any of that, guys. And see, this is why. Why are we having a hearing on this show? And, I, and why am I on my social media platforms having a hearing about the mistakes Trump made early on in this and not the mistakes that DeSantis made early on in this? That is a great question. And frankly, I should have done a better job of answering it. My mistake. Here's the answer. One guy, when he was confronted with mistakes, reversed course. And what, is an, what does repentance mean? Repentance does not mean you feel sorry for bad stuff you did. That's not what it means. That could be guilt. That could be shame. And those are real emotions, but they're not. You can't have a long lasting worldview off of guilt and shame. Eventually, the guilt and the shame goes away. The desire to re-engage that behavior returns, right? And you just go through this cycle of guilt, shame, return. Guilt, shame, return. Guilt, shame, return. You go back, you're going to confession, asking for forgiveness over and over again for the same things over and over and over again. That's not repentance. Repentance means to turn away. To turn away from what you were doing that was wrong and to go down a different road. On every mistake he made with COVID, Ron DeSantis did that. That's why I'm not having a hearing about the mistakes he made in March and April of 2020. He did, do, he did those things. Donald Trump to this day has not. Donald Trump could repent tomorrow. Donald Trump could say, you know what? Fine. Jay Bhattacharya, Scott Atlas, Harvey Risch. Come on down to Mar-a-Lago. Let's put it up on Rumble because you know it gets censored on YouTube. Give me the what's up. You know what I'm saying? He could do that tomorrow. That's what DeSantis did, by the way. He brought all those people to Florida and YouTube banned it. He could do this. He could show repentance. And that would, by the way, in my view, greatly narrow the road for Ron DeSantis to the nomination. Because even if a lot of people don't care as much about this as me, it would show an aspect of Trump's character to the public that they've never seen before. Humility. Nobody's ever seen that. I don't know that the public would know what to do with Donald Trump showing any level of humility. There's no repentance there, so there's no remorse. So since he wants to act as if every decision he made during that period of time was the right one, he forces me... Unless you want me to lie to you, I'm never going to do that. There's never been a time in my career that I've ever come on here and said something that I knew in advance was false, and I earnestly tried to convince you otherwise. There's been plenty of times I've missed, I've taken the other side's view for a point, but I maliciously represented false information as true. It doesn't mean everything I say is right. Being incorrect or wrong, or having a stupid opinion isn't the same as lying. He's not offering me that option. You're actually, if you want to go back and relitigate what Ron DeSantis did wrong and compare it to Donald, what Donald Trump did wrong, you're actually not practicing equal scales and justice. You're a Pharisee. Because Ron DeSantis has actually shown repentance and remorse for what he did wrong. To go back now 
and ignore that completely and relitigate those things is not mercy and grace. It's legalism. Trump has the same repentance and remorse available to him. He just has to act and choose it. He has not. So therefore, he leaves us. Since he won't choose grace, that only leaves us with law. He leaves me no other choice but to relitigate all of his choices because he continues to hold on to the notion that these were good moves and good choices, and they weren't. They were devastating. There are 10,000 small businesses, which are almost all family businesses, that were permanently eliminated and will never come back. He just erased them with his lockdowns, erased them. They're never coming back. And then all the poison jab data. All those died suddenly people, none of them coming back, none of them. Not a one. I'm holding Trump accountable for what he did during those days because he's asking me to. I'm giving him what he wants. I have, every decision I made was great. I don't regret it at all. Okay. Then I guess we have to look at those decisions then, don't we? Yes. Yes, we do. What would, he, what would I do tomorrow if he came out and said, all right, man, let's get real here. I, I honestly don't know. Faint? Praise Jesus. Because I think that's the only power left in the universe that could compel him to do that. Because it certainly won't be polls or remorse or repentance uh, on his own. I mean, I, I stood 10 feet from the guy getting ready to take a job from him. When he looked in front of a crowd of Bible-believing Christians and said, I've never asked God for forgiveness because I've never done anything wrong. I was 10 feet from when he said that. 10 feet away when he said that. On national television, actually. That's why. Why are we really relitigating his mistakes and not DeSantis's? My governor made mistakes, by the way. Didn't agree with all her policies. We had mask mandates for a while. Difference was, she actually put time limits on her. She reevaluated her decisions. And when she, when we got to the time limit, she didn't just instantly really put out a press release saying, hey, we're just going to keep it up. Looked at the data. If the data showed we don't need this or it wasn't working, what did we do? Stop yeah. doing it. Yeah. I don't need perfection. I need integrity. They're not the same thing. None of us is perfect. We desperately need to evict these people that are in the White House. They've got, this is a demonic sanctuary right now. And the guy that right now many people favor to be the nominee, I don't think has a possible, had much of a possibility of winning. I'd like to change that. So that my only option, I think, to win the next election isn't a guy whose wife just is recovering from breast cancer that may come back at any point in time, or he may decide I've got young kids and this ain't worth putting him through it. But he's got to show that remorse and repentance. He has shown none. I don't owe him anything and neither do you. He owes it to us. At least that's the way I think populism is supposed to work, right? Isn't power supposed to, supposed to flow up, not down? Well, the good news is a lot of Americans, increasing number of Americans, have had it with corporate uh, woke political activism, corporatism, fascism, etc. The bad news is there really aren't too many outlets for you to go elsewhere if you are one of them. <laughs> I mean, th- unfortunately, this is just uh, such a hydra. Um, this thing is metastasized at such a molecular level. There aren't a lot of places to go these days if you just want to completely immune yourself from it. Thankfully, one of them happens to be with a product that all of us are required to use here in modern America, our mobile phones. Make the switch today to Patriot Mobile America's only, I guess I would call it a really American, mobile phone company left. Uh, and right now, uh, you can make a switch anytime. Uh, you move to a new area and you're in one of those uh, single digit percentages where the coverage of one network is not as good as the other. And then sometimes it can be as simple as there's an area, you, you use the phone a lot in your basement. And this network works really well, and the other one doesn't. Weird, who knows? Want to make the switch? Fine. They'll do that for you for free without changing carriers at Patriot Mobile. And you'll be giving directly to a company whose values align with yours. Just go to 878-PATRIOT. Right now, you can call them to make the switch. 878-PATRIOT. Get a free activation with the offer code Steve. Or go to PatriotMobile.com slash Steve. That's PatriotMobile.com slash Steve. 
All right, let us continue on with Feedback Friday. Joel in San Antonio says, I've, uh, as always, love the show. And thank you all for you guys that you guys do for truth. Yesterday, you said the Nigerian Brothers video where they were reenacting their uh, fake assault on Jesse Smollett uh, might be the early candidate for video of the year. I'm sorry, but there's no way as great as it was that that video is better than the Kaufman Center for Coincidences one. And Joel is correct about that. We have that flagged, right, Aaron? Okay. Because that was like in January, yeah, like right after we early. came back. Yeah. Because, you know, the, the, the way these years go now, about 14 times I'm going to say that's the video of the year. So January is going to seem like it was four years ago by the time we get to December and we make the final call on all of this. So uh, well done, Joel. You are exactly correct. The Kaufman Center for Coincidences was breathtakingly good. You know how we have a tendency to look at what the Babylon Bee does and we're like, Man, we wish we would have thought of that. The Babylon Bee looked at that video and said, wished we would have thought yeah, of that. That's yes. how good it was. Yeah. Uh, David writes, this is interesting, guys. Um, and he says he got this from the critical drinker. All right. Netflix tracks when people stop watching shows. So if one keeps their account, the second they encounter wokeness or LGBT, FQFU, uh, or any gender BS, you just stop watching. Click the back button and don't return to that show. The key is not to skip over it, but to stop watching the show altogether. Like what's going on with The Last of Us. That's the zombie show based on the popular video game, right? Which someone, I've not seen an episode. I'm I'm zombied out. I've been zombied out ever since Negan took the the baseball bat to Glenn on The Walking Dead. I was like, okay, I've just had it with the nihilism. I got to drop out. That was like, what, four or five years ago. (laughs) So I haven't done a single zombie thing since. Um... So I'm not watching the show, but I've read that it's super gay, like super gay. The show is. Yes, that's what I'm told. Yeah. So. um, So if you watch episode three, just hit the back button and stop watching it. And Netflix gets the hint. That's what triggers their algorithm. So he said he got David says he got this from the critical drinker. I'm wondering. Do we just start actively finding every show on Netflix with an LGBTQFU category marker. Every show, every movie. Just start it. And then do this to the algorithm every time. Just sit back and don't go back and watch it again. You know what I'm saying? Like actively go out and try to find the shows and movies on the platform that have that marker and just jam them with the algorithm. Thoughts. Sure. Good like, if you're bored on a rainy day, you had a few hours to kill. Why not? Right? I'm I'm skeptical of its ultimate. I mean, it's not like, talk about. We were just talking off air about the whole principle of we know that they know that we like they. We've seen industries torpedo themselves. Like we've talked about journalism. We've both been in the same newsroom. Like we've I, I had these conversations. You know, you knowingly. You're, you're taking money out of your... You're just burning piles of money that mm-hmm. you could be... Ha- yeah, it's worth it. And it's not like they don't understand <laughs> that this is not is a sell for a lot of people. They don't care. Yeah. I'm still fine shoving oh, it in but, the face. Yeah, yeah I'm still you, fine giving it a shot if I'm bored. Time. Yeah, why not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm still fine doing it just out of spite if nothing yeah, else. There, Even yeah. if it doesn't trigger the algorithm just because I'm that yeah. kind of guy. Spite really brings a lot of things home, doesn't it? Does. It does. Yeah, it's just for the hell of it. Why yeah. not? Yes. So we're going to go from tips from the critical drinker, drinker to Diane, who describes herself as the useless drinker. Um, to make a long story short, I'd like to thank the three of you for your everyday doses of the truth and exposure of the depth of corruption of our government pharmacy media conglomeration and that practices on the daily. My favorite is when you all get really mad. Steve turns all red. Looks like he's going to blow his uh, top a la Michael Bolton belting out an epic ballad from the 80s. He's a lot better looking than me. Uh, Todd gets all red and starts sputtering out sentence fragments and Aaron gets all dark and smoky, purses his lips, then a long pause, then drops a total truth bomb. That is some very in-depth analysis of our idiosyncrasies, by the way. I'm glad a woman sent us this. If this had come from Don, I might, I might've stopped reading right there. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Don, you're looking at our, you know. Our, our physical manifestations way too closely, and that's a dude code violation, and there needs to be an intervention. Fair? Fair. 
Uh, she goes on to say, I'm a nurse of 23 years, fired from the company I worked for after 22 years for not taking the poison poke. Thankfully, my husband, who's a real man, supported my decision to not take the jab. I'm blessed with the opportunity to make that choice as many of my coworkers were forced to take the gene juice so they could keep their jobs and feed their families. Though I have no regrets, I was devastated to get fired from the company that I was planning on retiring from. In October of 21, this company fired 800 plus good people, denying religious and medical exemptions after a careful and individual review via an email sent to all of us within minutes of each other. I had a new job in five minutes with a company that accepted accepted religious exemptions, no questions asked, and I've continued my work in the hospital with the intent of advocating for unjabbed patients and calling out the use of remdesivir. Your show was a daily validation of my decision and got me through a dark and difficult time, so thank you. You're very welcome. After listening to other viewers' suggestions that you guys send books to Donald Trump, and many of you did, by the way, I got a ton of emails from people, and you know what I liked? All, the, all of the inscriptions that accompanied that you guys sent me were all very respectful, and they should be. Because he did do a lot for Christians when he was president. And so if you are one, he did a lot for patriots if you are one. So even when he's wrong, and on this he is absolutely cosmically, fundamentally, universally, existentially deadly wrong. All right? You should still honor what he has done before when he was right on other things. So I liked the fact that you guys gave him some what for, but you also sent him, it was done very respectfully. So thank you. Diane says, I decided to send your book to the CEO of my former company, a horrid, evil little lady with beady eyes and small teeth who is sustaining her record of running hospital systems into the ground. My gift message said the following. Read this, keeping in mind the 800 plus good people you fired and an untold number of employees injured from your mandated shot. We will never forget, unquote. Who knows if anyone in that office will actually read it, but I love the idea that the red and black book cover will be seared into their minds Nevertheless, that is a woman who understands out of spite, if for no other reason. And I respect that. Yeah, and what was her? That's name? Diane, the yeah, useless yeah, drinker. Yeah, yeah, you're not useless, Diane. Not at all. Well, well done. Adrian Pordomo says, uh, I'm a high school junior uh, from Jackson, New Jersey. Along with being a student, I also host the Teenage Latino Conservative Podcast from my home. I was listening to your show one day and I heard that you wanted to hear from young men who had a consistency of courage and conviction. I've been trying to embody these qualities in the short time since the start of my podcasting career. Uh, I've listened extensively to your show and I know how strongly pro-life you are and with the deeply touching and beautiful story of your mother and how she chose life and allowed you to become what you are, what you are now. I'd be deeply honored to receive some of your advice and guidance on how to grow my audience and influence among others in my age group. I am looking forward to watching the nefarious movie. The book was one of my favorite reads of all time, even better than Dante's Inferno. Now, listen, man, I, I think nefarious plot is the best thing I'll ever write. That, that's the most important book I'll ever write. Nefarious plot is the best thing I'll ever write. It is not Dante's Inferno, but I appreciate it. Nevertheless, <laughs> um, I would look, f I would, I would look for platforms that like right now, I just saw something during the break that Crowder, our former colleague here at Blaze TV went out on his own and is doing his show independently now via Rumble. And he's averaging over, I think it's 1.2 million viewers per episode right now on Rumble, which that's, that's incredible for YouTube which is the second largest search engine in the world next to Google. Rumble has never seen traffic like that. I would be looking right now at what are the platforms that are not completely given over or are the alternatives to the mainstream ones and try to, to build my position now. I don't, I think I mentioned this before. I've ne I never, when we worked together here since 2015, I never met Steven Crowder, never had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with him the whole time. I did have a direct message conversation with him once before we worked together that he uh, came to me. We were both going out on our own into syndication for the first, you know, on our own. And he was considering whether to go into terrestrial radio or whether to go directly to social media and YouTube. And, um, I made the decision because of 
you know, with my own investors, I was, that was too much risk to take. I didn't know that world very well. And so we made the decision to go with Salem radio and to go with terrestrial radio. He made the decision to go where he had the absolute most amount of control and freedom before all the censorship kicked in at YouTube. And it's pretty obvious which one of us made the best career choice yeah. there. Okay. Um, because, uh, he read the market, right. I did not. And, um, he kind of got grandfathered in for a while before they started cracking down, but eventually they got to the shows like him too and drove him largely away. And so YouTube is kind of a supplement to what he's doing now on Rumble uh, when it used to be the other way around. I would be looking at those platforms right now because even if most of your friends are on other platforms, anything you're going to want to say to truly impact them, they're just going to censor it and take it away from you. And as, as members of the younger generation, you'll be more prone to, to, to want to adapt, to be willing to adapt to newness. Trust me, as you get older, you don't want to adapt to newness. I mean, the reason I hired my daughter last year to run TikTok and Instagram, I don't know the apps, never been on the apps, don't want to know. I, I just don't want to learn anything new. I've, I'm, I've got too much going on. And I would have never said that like 10 years ago. I wouldn't have said that at 40, but at 50, I'm like, you know what? I don't want to know. You just take care of it and tell me what I need to do. You're not thinking that way when you're a high school junior. So I, I would follow the Crowder example and look for the platforms that have the least amount of censorship right now and, and try to build your audience and direct your audience there rather than go where you might have more initial traffic. But the minute you start gaining any traction and actually saying things that you think are meaningful, they just cut you off at the knees and take it away from you. Which, by the way, is why you should consider, if you're listening to me right now, subscribing to Blaze TV. Because who knows? Who knows when the day comes that Apple says, yeah, we're not, we're not going to host Steve Dace anymore on the podcast. That could happen at any point in time. That's why, we're, that's why we didn't go out on our own. And, and that's why we stayed aligned with, with, uh, with the Blaze to make sure with its subscriber base that we have a, we have a built in audience should all that censorship come one day and, and shut us off. Right. So if you want to become a subscriber to blaze TV, uh, blaze tv.com slash Dace is where you can go. Uh, it's just 10 bucks a month. Blaze tv.com slash Dace. You guys want to add any more, uh, advice for Adrian or disagree with the advice I gave? No, I think that's fantastic. No, I think you always check your motivations, but I think that was pretty comprehensive advice. Yeah, I'm platform wise. I've all recognize your uh, weaknesses and my ability to vision quest on that front just from a lack of like interest. I definitely like would have been in a lot of times like a guy who's like would have hold on to the Bobby buggy wick factory for too long still reading a newspaper on a plane uh, yeah 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 yeah. yeah. so no i that's not and i give steve a lot of credit because he doesn't i i remember the conversations we had internally about that it's not an easy call to make and Mm -hmm. um and this was pre-censorship now Mm -hmm. i mean i don't you're you're confronted with a lot of very difficult choices no matter what you do like i don't know because i'm not trying to monetize rumble but even though they're drawing that kind of traffic, I would be surprised if Steven is able to monetize Rumble at the same rate that you'd be able to monetize getting 1.2 million views on YouTube. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So that's the thing. that ha- So it, that is an excellent development for our business. If, 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 if a platform like Rumble can sustain that level of traffic and audience um, so that we don't have to do business with these kinds of companies any longer, that's a, tr- that's a tremendous development uh, for, uh, for our, our business and movement, you know, period. Whether your name's Steven Crowder or anybody's name. So... I hope it continues to be successful. I think the next test, though, is we're all for profits. None of us are doing this for free. It's all for profit. Mm -hmm. So can you how successfully can you monetize those one point two million views, you know, given what is available to you from an ad ad, ad insert perspective at a place like YouTube? And I don't know the answer to that. You know, that's I don't know. But that would be the next step. But man, if what. uh, Bongino, because that's his platform and some others and and Crowder, if what they have come together to put together over there, if that thing could absolutely become a Petra, I'm not going to complain. 
Uh, we, we don't need fewer uh, options, uh, you know, in terms of platforms that don't demand um, uh, censorship. I mean, I, I'm probably the biggest show in the country that didn't post a single damn video on YouTube for what, Aaron, five months, six months? Oh, it was longer than that. Yeah. Because of all the censorship there. You know, I mean, Tim Pool's got one of the biggest shows in the country. YouTube is almost his exclusive monetization tool. I mean, I've, I'm, I probably am the biggest show in the country that posted nothing on YouTube for nearly half a year because of the censorship and how many strikes and stuff we got. So you bet your sweet bippy, man. I'm hope I'm rooting like hell that this crowd or rumble thing not only. So the first step is, can you get the audience to migrate with mm-hmm. you? And then can you sustain technically? Can you absorb that level of traffic? So it feels like maybe they're passing the first two tests. The third test is now, can you successfully monetize that? Right. Yeah. And so I hope they check the next box, too. That won't be bad for our business at all. That'd be great to have more options, not fewer, for sure. All right. That's going to do it for us. And we hope you have a great weekend and we will see you again on Monday. We'll stick around and do overtime for Blaze TV subscribers. For the rest of you, we will see you then. Until then, John 317.